Welcome, everybody. I'm John Chorciari. I'm the director of the Wiser Diplomacy Center here at the Ford School. And we're really happy to have this opportunity to partner with the American Academy of Diplomacy uh, in hosting a live recording of American Diplomat uh, on the theme of U.S.-Brazil bromance, what's in store for us. Uh, we are joined here by, of course, my colleague uh, Mel Levitsky, by Laura Bennett, who's a producer and host of American Diplomat, uh, by, on the far end, Ambassador uh, Thomas Shannon, who will be introduced shortly, uh, and also by Ambassador Peter Romero, who is a 25-year uh, uh, a, a veteran of the Foreign Service. Uh, he served most recently as uh, Assistant Secretary of the Western Hemisphere uh, at the State Department. Before that, as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary. He also served at State as Ambassador to Ecuador during the Peru-Ecuador War uh, and uh, was Chargé d'Affaires in El Salvador. He's also one of the original architects and instigators of Plan Colombia. And so I'm going to turn it over to Ambassador Romero, uh, who will take the introduction to the podcast from there. Thank you all. Not that close, dude. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to American Diplomat, real stories behind the news. I'm Pete Romero, and with me is... Laura Bennett. <laughs> La compañera Laura Bennett. And before we get started today, what I wanted to do is also uh, remind people, if you, already, if you haven't already heard, we've got... Uh, one of these kitschy um, still photos on our website, uh, amdipstories.com, which features our org. three org, sorry, org, <laughs> which features our three uh, golden doodle dogs at the microphone. Uh, and it wasn't just whimsy, uh, they were actually uh, the reason why we were all together. Laura and I met walking our two dogs, our respective doodles, uh, in uh, Eastern Maryland, and the third doodle, Santos. Uh, is the, um, the uh, pet of the owner of our studios in Washington Podcast Village. So please check that out if you haven't already. They are cute. They are. I mean, it's very cute. It's good, very but, cute. I mean, these, these but there are dogs, so, you know. <laughs> uh, we have a special treat today for our listeners. We're pleased uh, to be coming to you from the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Diplomacy at the University of Michigan. Our visit is sponsored by the Wiser Diplomatic Center, our host, Professor Cho Chari, uh, and it is part of a series that we have ongoing in our podcast called Is It Happening Here? We have about 80 podcasts thus far. We've been in business for about uh, 15 months, uh, and uh, I think that uh, you will find some very interesting things, particularly as it relates to first-person stories of our diplomats in practice overseas. Uh, is it happening here as a series that we run from time to time? We've looked at Putin's uh, Russia, Erdogan's Turkey, uh, Chavez and Maduro's Venezuela, and today what we want to do is to look at um, uh, Bolsonaro's Brazil and its relationship with the United States and what is likely to happen. I am pleased to have with us uh, two of the, probably the most informed, practiced diplomats that you could uh, bring to this particular discussion. Uh, to my left is Tom Shannon, had a 33, 33, 34. 34 and a half. 34 and a half, excuse me, 34.5 <laughs> uh, year uh, career in the Foreign Service. Uh, he was um, the uh, Assistant Secretary for Western Hemisphere Affairs. He was Ambassador to Brazil from 2010 to 2013, and we're going to pick his brain about that period particularly. And also the number three person in the State Department as Undersecretary for Political Affairs uh, to include the counselor of the, depart the department for a while. We also are pleased to have with us today uh, Ambassador Melvin Levitsky, a retired career minister in the Foreign Service, Professor of International Policy and Practice at the University of Michigan's Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. He taught for eight years as a professor in practice in public administration and international affairs at Syracuse University. Ambassador Levitsky was elected by a vote of the United Nations Economic and Social Council to a seat on the International Narcotics Control Board, an independent body of experts headquartered in Vienna and responsible for for monitoring and promoting standards of drug control established by international treaties. During his 35-year career in the Foreign Service as a U.S. diplomat, he was ambassador to Brazil, uh, assistant secretary of state for international narcotics matter, 
uh, Executive Secretary of the State Department, Ambassador to Bulgaria. He is the recipient of several meritorious and superior honor awards and distinguished honor awards. Ambassador Levitsky, welcome. Well, thank you. Ambassador Shannon, you. welcome. Thank you Thanks very much. Thanks for coming to the Ford School. <laughs> And well, you guys, like, you know so much. It's like almost... Don't forget your intro. Here. I wasn't. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. American Diplomat is a project of the Una Chapman Cox Foundation in partnership with the American Academy of Diplomacy. We're talking. So welcome. Uh, guys, what I'd really like to do is to scroll back a little bit in time. It wasn't but about five, six years ago that the old adage of... Brazil is the country of the future and always will be, seemed to be outdated. It looked like it was really Brazil's time. Uh, they were a leader in the region, if not internationally. They had become members of the BRIC countries. Uh, they, so what the BRIC is? Uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and some people include South, South Africa. Africa. Oh, gosh. Okay. Okay. And uh, kind of a counterweight, a counterweight to U.S. influence, so to speak, I see. diplomatically. That was essentially, it was supposed to be the emerging great powers. Diplomatically as well as economically? As well okay. as economically, right, gotcha. exactly. Okay. And so that coupled with uh, a find of perhaps the largest oil and gas reserves in the world found off the coast, uh, an incredible production of ethanol, an export of ethanol regionally. Uh, it just really looked at growth uh, growth rates which were uh, through the ceiling. It just looked like Brazil's time had finally come. So Tom, then what? what'd you do wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can say that I left before it all came undone. Right. But <laughs> let, let, first of all, let me just start by um, saying what a pleasure it is to be here, uh, to be with you, Pete and Laura, but especially to be with uh, Mel Levitsky. Uh, who, when I was a younger officer, was an icon in our foreign service and someone who I admired greatly. But more importantly, uh, when I was ambassador in Brazil, in the entryway to the ambassador's office, uh, as you walk into the larger suite, uh, all of the former ambassador's photographs are hanging on the wall. So every day that I came to work and every day that I left work, Mel Levitsky looked at me <laughs> and asked me, what have you done for your country today? <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I had a good answer and sometimes I didn't. Um, this was long before Make America Great Again. So the, uh, Levitsky had a corner on that market. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but, um, you know, I, I knew that something was about to happen in Brazil in the summer of 2013. I left in September of 2013 uh, when at the Confederations Cup opener, in which Brazil was playing Japan. Uh, this was a lead up to the World Cup that Brazil was also going to host, and then of course the Olympics, and was gonna be a series of, of global sporting events that was going to cement uh, Brazil's stature uh, globally um, as a soft power that had emerged as a global power, maybe one of the first. Uh, as the teams came onto the field, and as Dilma Rousseff and the then head of FIFA prepared themselves to make opening speeches, when her image came up on the screen, she everyone, was the president. She right? was the president at the time. I'm sorry, President Dilma Rousseff. Uh, everyone in the stadium started whistling, and whistling in Brazil is like booing. Oh. And I remember sitting back and thinking, "Uh oh, <laughs> something is happening uh, here time in to leave. here in Brazil uh, with a largely middle class crowd, a largely uh, largely a crowd from Brasilia, uh, a government city." Mm -hmm. um, responding to uh, their president in, in this fashion, and, and it was striking. And of course, um, uh, very soon after that, uh, uh, actually even before that, had started the, uh, uh, the political repercussions of demonstrations that had taken place uh, throughout much of the summer of 2013. Begin I'm Tom, sorry. didn't they start uh, with protests against the amount of money that the Brazilian government was spending? on all of these Olympic facilities and, and World Cup facilities? Actually, it starts with a hike in uh, bus fare in Sao Paulo, yeah. and, and a fairly small hike. Uh, but it had a huge impact on the many uh, citizens of Sao Paulo who traveled by bus. They started demonstrating, but then it caught fire and just mm. rolled across the country. Some of it was linked to spending on, on stadiums, uh, but it was mostly uh, focused on concern about uh, high tax rates and low service provision. And, and so this is what generates it, this is what's, what, what begins it. Uh, and this of course is combined with a political crisis which leads to President Rousseff's impeachment 
and then effectively the collapse of Brazil's political class and opens the space that we saw most recently with the election of Jair Bolsonaro. Wow. So, Mel, did you, did you foresee this happening in Brazil? I mean, there's a certain nostalgia in Brazil, even, uh, even more so today, it seems, for the time that the military junta, the 20 years or so that the military junta ran the country. Mm. Um, did you see any of that? Did you feel any of that? Did you feel like a lot of Brazilians felt like the government had gone too far? And what year would this have been? So I was, I was there, well, Go back, way back, I was uh, a vice consul, my second assignment, in Belém do Pará, which is right on the mouth of the Amazon River, for a couple of years when we had a consulate there. And then I was transferred to Brasilia as we were moving the embassy to Brazil. Oh, yeah, from Rio. So I had that experience. And then I did what I mostly wanted to do in my career. I did Soviet affairs, Eastern Europe, et cetera. And then, came, and then was fortunate enough to be named ambassador to Brazil uh, in the uh, Clinton administration in 1994. So I served for four years there because we had had a succession of replacements for me who dropped out or were banged by the Congress, including Brian Atwood, who had been head, who had been the director of the Agency for International Development, who was very well qualified uh, to be ambassador to Brazil. And uh, he was held up essentially by Jesse Helms at the time because he had been uh, against the idea of bringing USAID, the Agency of International Development, into the State Department, as if you remember mm -hmm. USIA right. was and the Agency for um, Arms Control and Disarmament was. So, um, so I had a long history with Brazil and always retained an interest, even during the time when I was Assistant Secretary for International Narcotics Matters, because Brazil became a kind of transit country uh, for drugs coming out of uh, Colombia, essentially, in that area in the Andes. Well, you remember that very well, Pete, I when do. you were there. I do. So my sense, uh, I was very fortunate to be there at a time when things really changed for the positive in Brazil. When I got to Brazil in uh, about June, uh, right before the 4th of July, in, in a June 1994, inflation was running at about 40% a month. So if you were paid by a sal if you had a salary, you had to spend it right away. That day. Because if you didn't spend it at the end of the month, the money was 40% less. In fact, I remember very clearly this uh, little story where uh, we, were trying to, we were going to buy some things for the 4th of July reception, and we had to buy a lot of things on the local market. So I went over to the, we had a little bank, a small banking facility on the um, embassy grounds, and they gave me a sack of money. Uh, you know, I needed a couple of thousand dollars. It was a, literally a sack of money. <laughs> and as I'm walking across the lot, I thought to myself, you know, as I'm walking across this lot, this money is getting to be worth less. <laughs> so I called faster. Well, right, <laughs> absolutely. So I called my wife and I said, I'm sending out a sack of money. Have our, you know, we have this people that worked in the, uh, in the embassy that did the 4th of July party. So have them go out and buy everything right away today. Because if you wait, you know, steadily goes down. Well, President Cardozo, who had been finance minister under that government, which was the Itamar Franco government, um, was elected and, in fact, stopped even before with his plan, stopped inflation in its tracks. Um, the middle class began to grow. Uh, inflation was essentially licked and kept going down, which was the biggest thing in Brazil for at least the workers you know, it couldn't play the overnight bank rate to, you know, to play the, uh, the money market. And it was a period when um, things really took off. Now, if you look at that period of time, when I left, things were really on a high. It wasn't because of me. It was because of the Brazilian government. No, we're trying to pin this on Tom. Yeah, it's Tom's, it's Tom's <laughs> fault, not mine. Um, but when I left, things, things were really moving. I can remember we had a, we, our residence was out uh, a little bit further out of town, and there were even monkeys in the trees. A few months into the Real plan, Cardoza's plan, all of a sudden the highway across that went across our property, or in front of our property, was jammed with cars because middle class people that lived out in these suburbs, these old towns that were where the workers began to build Brasilia, suddenly were buying cars. It got jammed mm -hmm. up. Uh, monkeys went away. They don't like uh -huh. people. They don't like fumes. They, they don't mm -hmm. like noise. Um, that was 
a negative, but the positive was that you got the middle class participating in the economy, mm -hmm. and Cardozo was wildly popular. Yeah. He wasn't, he, there were th certain things he couldn't get through the Congress, but that's the, that's what happens with every Brazilian Yeah, but government. he was also one of the big uh, first uh, thinkers and movers behind this third way Third thing, way, exactly. Which, What's uh, the third way? Clinton, Tony Blair. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Right. Basically, uh, a third way between, you know, kind of naked capitalism right. and socialism. Uh -huh. You know, kind of what we're discussing today, yeah. not very effectively, but democratic socialism. Uh, today, in terms of where where do you where does your country lie at any given time in terms of leveling the playing field for people to compete and that sort of thing, right. and they were talking about this 25 years ago, 20 years ago. And so there were more social programs during that time, and it helped people out of poverty, or what was I it? I think it was just the general economy. I think mm -hmm. the the social programs really were uh, particularly uh, Bolsa de Familia, which was uh -huh. Lula's big uh, right. subsidy plan for poorer families. Uh, didn't come in until Lula actually was elected uh, government. So there were some social, pro but mostly people arose because the economy, you know, it's that, you know, rising mm -hmm. sea yeah, lifts all boats. Yeah. Um, that turned out to be quite true. You could just see it in places mm -hmm. like Sao Paulo, Rio, the big cities. Mm -hmm. Even in some of the smaller cities, industries began to come in. Agro-business was huge in Brazil, com competed with the United States. Um, so that, I mean, that was a period of time when I had a lot of hope for Brazil. When I left, I thought things were going to be well, uh, go well. But you remember at the end of the Cardoso period, suddenly what crops up? The most, I think, the biggest problem that Brazil has, corruption. You, that, that came in then? It wasn't part of the... the, end of the at the end of the uh, uh, Cardoso period, he served eight years, uh, there was a few, uh, looking at it now, were many scandals. Mm -hmm. But these things began to, you know, where, where government officials took advantage of their position. And, that and I think that's a big issue. Previously. Tom knows this as well. Big well, issue with Brazil is corruption and do, do the people have any trust in the government when they see that money is being skimmed off and deals are being made? Well, you know, it used to be in Latin America that the, the public response to a lot of uh, public, credible allegations of corruption by officials was, why didn't I get my piece? You know? right. But now things have changed. Things have changed dramatically. But Tom, what happened in, in this period? You were, you were there during uh, I, what would constitute the heyday of, of, uh, of, um, of Lula, if not Dilma uh, Rousseff. What, what happened? I mean, think, you, know, you had the Bolsa Familia, you had uh, people being lifted out of poverty, being paid to keep their kids in school, some great, great social engineering going on. And the economy is booming you know, as, uh, you know, all kinds of indicators, including the kind of indicate, indicator that uh, Mel was talking about in terms of traffic. What happened? But wait, one, first of all, tell us who Lula is, and let's, can we, can, can you help us understand what happened from the perspective of the people of the country? What's different for the average Joe? Is it violent yet? I mean, what, what is changing in their attitudes and what's causing that? Well, first, um, Ignacio Lula da Silva is a, a political leader, a trade unionist and political leader of extraordinary importance in Brazilian history, uh, who um, uh, eventually is elected president uh, in the aftermath of um, what uh, Ambassador Levitsky mentioned, uh, and is able to um, uh, take advantage of the economic stability that Fernando Henrique Cardoso created as president of Brazil is able to build in through Bolsa Familia a social outreach program and social financing program that addresses the, uh, the, most, the, the poorest people uh, in Brazil and, 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 Familia... and ensures, it means, it means like the, the family basket. Uh, it ensures that families have a minimal amount of money uh, in order to buy what is necessary. And it's done through a very innovative program, effectively of debit cards, oh. uh, and money is paid not to heads of household, but to female heads of household. It's paid to women, because what? the assumption is that women will spend the money responsibly, and that <laughs> men will not. That's um, why, when you ask me why there are no strong women, that's because they're just too sensible, rather than strong men. We're, we'll we're, get to that point. But yeah. what's, important here, it, what's important here is that as the Lula administration begins to address extreme poverty in Brazil, uh, a middle class is building, which Ambassador Levitsky spoke about, 
And at one point, it reaches about 100 million people, which is about half of Brazil's population. And this has a huge impact in Brazil, because a country which historically was defined by inequality, by the grand difference between the wealthiest and the poorest, now has a, sort of a center of a middle class. It still has great inequality, but that middle class creates a degree of stability and predictability and creates a consumer market in Brazil that did not exist previously. And this helps drive the economy in an important way. But what's striking about the middle class is that they believe that they achieved their economic well-being through their own hard work mm -hmm. and not necessarily through government programs. Mm. And so they become demanding of a government in mm -hmm. a, in opposed, uh, as opposed to being adoring of a government. And this is where the issues of high crime rates, of corruption, and then economic slowdown have a huge political impact because they create and generate a, a group of, of now politically active Brazilians, a middle class, who have no political voice. They have no political party or political candidate to represent them. And the result is uh, a, a focus by the middle class on what they consider to be uh, the, the inability of government to address the problems that are most important to them, but also a significant focus on corruption. And this is what leads to the investigations in the aftermath of a significant scandal called the car wash scandal. It ultimately leads to the, the takedown of Dilma Rousseff's government and the collapse of Brazil's political class. But you know, it's interesting, when you look at Brazil and Lula takes, brings all of these people through his programs out of poverty. The, the middle class is strengthened, which is what we've all tried to do as diplomats, is do what we could to strengthen the middle classes, okay? Instead of being subservient and eternally thankful to a government that does that, as, is, as happened in, in Venezuela, mm -hmm. right next door, mm -hmm. you've got a core uh, which a core group, which is obviously dwindling lately, that stuck with Chavez and Maduro for a long, long time simply because they had things that they'd never dream of having before, like a house, like enough food, like medical care, decent education for their kids. They never had this, never had a hope of having it, but now they've got it. But the result is that they're so thankful that they put themselves subservient to a government that every day becomes more and more corrupt. Why didn't that happen in Brazil? Because democracy has deep roots in Brazil, and oh. Brazil's constitution is a profound instrument of political ordering. It's important to understand that, that, that President Lula is still very popular in Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in fact, jail. He's, 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 he's in prison. He's, he's, yeah, yeah, he's, he's, yeah. he's, he's incarcerated. Um, yeah, he's but incarcerated. Um, he was prevented from running in this last presidential election by decisions made by the courts. Um, but there are some who believe that should, if he had run, won, he, uh, he would have won. If he had run, he would have won. Um, uh, but uh, independent of that, it's important to understand something about Brazil. First of all, I think that Brazil has already become a country of the future, certainly a country of the present. It's a remarkable place. But during my time there, what I saw was a country which had used democratic processes and its constitution to transform Brazil as a country. When I arrived in Brazil the first time, I served seven years of my professional career in Brazil. When I arrived for the first time in 1989, um, I was, um, uh, Brazil was uh, a different country from when I returned again in 2010. I mean, it had the same boundaries, it had the, the same language, but it had gone through a social transformation. Some of it was building out the middle class, some of it was addressing uh, extreme poverty, but a lot of it was about building infrastructure. Um, and. Uh, in, in terms of, of what it was able to do in, in, in building a country that was able to expand across the entirety of its national territory, uh, it had done remarkable things. In fact, a country which was effectively a country of the coast had swung into becoming a country of the Amazon and of the West and had emerged as one of the world's largest food producers and food exporters, had uh, the, the highest amount of uh, sustainable or renewable energy. Uh, it was accomplishing remarkable things. And these things are still in place. Um, but, but what's striking about the, the political crisis that Brazil lived through is that imagine this in the United States. Imagine that a president is impeached, that his predecessor uh, is arrested and charged with crimes and imprisoned, that his his successor would then be um, arrested and charged with crimes, that the Speaker of the House uh, is removed from office and, and imprisoned, that 
the right. Senate Majority Leader is arrested and imprisoned, and that then the head of Apple, Boeing, and Ford are, are all arrested. That's mm -hmm. effectively what happened in Brazil. But the Brazilians clung to their institutions, they clung to their democratic purpose, and they believed in what their institutions could accomplish. And I think in many ways, this is the untold story of Brazil, because especially in the national media, people will wonder, well, does Jair Bolsonaro represent a threat to democracy? I would argue that independent of what his future might be, his election represents the Brazilian people's commitment to democracy and an insistence that their leaders be accountable to, to voters and, and ultimately respond to what um, the, the Brazilian people yeah. want. You know, I think, um, I remember an incident we, we had with corruption when, right before President uh, Clinton came to Brazil. We had put out what the commercial, remember the commercial manual? And it yeah. gives businessmen a kind of, you know, what, what, how do customs work, what's the, how, yeah. do, uh, how, how do, do you, how do you, how do you do business in Brazil? Yeah. And there was a sentence in there that, like page 130, that the press picked up on. And the sentence was, corrupção é endemica no Brasil. Corruption is endemic in Brazil. So it became a big thing, and I got calls from the, uh, I, and, I made, and I made a mistake because that was an honest statement. What I should have done with the president coming is just disavow it right away, even though it was true. Mm -hmm. But you know, sometimes honesty is not the best policy and it didn't work very well and we had to then say, well, it's a problem, but we ha we'll change the wording. Um, back that far. We're talking 1998? This is, ni this is 1995 when Clinton okay. came. So that's, you know, it's a yeah. long time ago. This has been a problem with Brazil. That along with inflation and just government bureaucracy has been a problem for a long time. And there have been various attempts to try to deal with this. Uh, Brazil is a thriving democracy. One thing that, um, that we didn't mention before is that, look, Bolsonaro loves the military and he has nostalgia or saudades for the, uh, uh, for the uh, military period of time. The military is very responsible. I don't think they want to get back into control anymore. I mean, that's the way I found them. I'm sure Tom did too. They, they. I, I don't think they're alone. Jobs. I think the Argentine military, the Bolivian military, <laughs> yeah, none of them want their, to run this thing because it's, their experience it's become it. way too complicated yeah. than it used to be. Sure, sure. But I think just w one more comment on this. One of the, uh, I think one of the the big things about Bolsa Familia was education, because as part of participation in Bolsa Familia. The, um, uh, the family had to make sure that the kid had a good attendance record at school and had a health check every, I've forgotten what it was, every, every few months. Big issue among the lower middle classes where sometimes they drop out of school and, and have to go work in the street. You know, we have these street children issues and, and children working and to make money for the family. So that subsidy helped, um, eventually will help Brazil, one hopes, get back to a, a point where education, particularly higher education, is open to everybody rather than just to the, the, uh, upper, the upper classes and the, uh, and the elite in Brazil. So what I'm wondering is about the average Brazilian, like, like the Joe Blow of Brazil. So I got a pretty good picture. Jose Rodriguez. Jose Rodriguez. Jose. 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 Yeah, yeah, okay. Jose. All right, so Jose. Jose. Okay. Jose has his. Rodriguez. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, so Jose, he's he's married and he has a couple of kids. Here, here's what I have read preceding the election of Bolsonaro. But you can tell me if how how mm -hmm. similar mm -hmm. this is to what you experienced. There um, were students in the north where it's warmer, like going to school and schools made of sticks and mud. They had to, a lot of the favelas, favelas? Favelas. Um, the, the really poor slummy neighborhoods um, had to cancel school for weeks and months because of gunfire. Literacy, illiteracy, excuse me, was on the rise. Um, and the solution from Bolsonaro's point of view was to get rid of the Marxist garbage that's in the education. That's how to fix that. And um, there's a lot of, um, People didn't like the corruption. They wanted privatization as a way of solving that. The murder rate was immense, six times that of the United States. And the leading cause of death for teenagers, 
Um, and so yes, this, this nostalgia for the time of law and order and um, also economic depression, people having difficulty obtaining food, shelter, basic needs, unemployment was high, extreme poverty was up, healthcare was a problem. Is this consistent with what you were seeing by the time you left Brazil preceding the election of Bolsonaro? So I, I guess to, to, to follow up on that, was all of the, the, the programs that the PT and Lula did and to a certain extent uh, 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 Dilma Rousseff, was that starting to unravel? No. No, but what, what, what first of all, I mean, what, what you described is not Jose Rodriguez. Um, it's not an average Brazilian. This is like the really desperate classes that are severely yeah, I mean, disenfranchised. Brazil, Brazil is, is a middle class country. I see. As I said, it's, it does have um, um, extreme poles and, and inequality. And you can find that kind of poverty uh, in Brazil, um, both in the Northeast and also in some of the favelas in the larger uh, major, uh, major cities. And this is not to say that there are not significant economic challenges, security challenges, and political gripes. Um, but Brazil is a, a very different country um, um, from, from what you, you just described. Oh, really? Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, Brazil went through uh, the most dramatic recession uh, of mm. its recorded history. Mm. Um, and in what year uh, would that have happened? Uh, in, in during the period where Dilma Rousseff was impeached and then in, in the immediate aftermath. And it's only now coming out. So it's over the last three or four years. And it, it's only now at a point where it has a positive growth rates. And so it's rebuilding its economy. Uh, and one of the, the, the larger challenges Brazil faces is, is that even as its economy grew, uh, during the, the period of Fernando Henrique Cardozo and President Lula and at the beginning of President Rousseff's term. Who, who succeeded Lula. Uh, who succeeded Lula. Um, uh, the, and, and grew to become the sixth largest economy in the world and well positioned to become the fifth largest. Uh, it had not seen uh, corresponding uh, rise in productivity uh, and competitiveness. And the Brazilian economy was largely inward looking. It was largely focused on its own consumers. Uh, and its trade was lar lar largely outbound. It was uh, resistant to opening its markets uh, because of lack of productivity and lack of competitiveness in some key areas. Um, it did have some world-class industry, especially Embraer in the, in the, the building of, of civil, civil, air, civil aviation aircraft. Um, but, um, but it is now at a point where it has positive growth again. It is attempting to take some very significant uh, structural reforms in its economy that are, are necessary. And one of Bolsonaro's largest challenges, or, or most important challenges right now, is generating economic growth that is going to allow the Brazilian economy to recuperate and to continue the kind of economic and social development that had begun under previous presidents. Could, so, I, could I just add sure. something here? So one of the real problems, I think, is the political system itself and how it's structured. You have a, a country that has in the Congress, 20, 25, 26 parties. And the ability to change parties almost overnight is, is very easy. So what happens? Um, when a governing coalition starts falling apart, deals start being made. And this is part of the, cor the corruption as well. So, you know, uh, nepotism comes into it, and my uncle needs this, and I'll vote for that, or I'll, I'll be part of the coalition. Uh, there's been, there have been various attempts to try to, for example, bring single-member single districts or, or into, into the system because now they vote by party lists, mm. which increases the, the number of parties. Or use the German system where you have a kind of mixed system of uh, single-member lists so that the constituents are actually tied to the person who's elected. If you go to Brazil now and you say, who's your representative, I mean, they can't really tell you. They can tell you all the people that were elected in their state and the three, the three senators, but there's no real responsibility. And it's been tried. I don't, I don't know whether Bolsonaro will try to go for that. I doubt it. But until that particular system um, is, is changed in some way, I, I, have, I'm, I really doubt. I don't have as, as optimistic a viewpoint of Brazil making it into even higher than it, than it has been sometimes in the past uh, because it just breeds corruption, it breeds uh, nepotism, it breeds all the kinds of things that make governments uh, unresponsive to people's needs. And so I think that's a, bi I think that's a big issue. Um, it's pretty hard to, to, uh, to envisage that 
this will change during Bolsonaro's period. I don't think that's his agenda at all, but one could hope. I, really, I want to agree very much with uh, Tom Shannon, Ambassador Shannon, on um, what has happened recently to make me more optimistic, which is a bunch of young prosecutors and younger judges who have actually gone after corruption in, in a way that has not only uh, had a mark in Brazil, but all over Latin America. If you think of Odebrecht, which is right. a big Brazilian company, you know, their tentacles have reached out all over Latin America well, and they're we, being prosecuted. We all have it. known, if you've worked in Latin America sure. and you're promoting U.S. business interests overseas, you know for a fact that Odebrecht's been there before sure. you and has paid lots of people off. You've known that, okay? You, know, you can't put your finger on it, but you know that that's what's happening. And so now there's a lot more justice out there. Right. And you can also say uh, to, uh, uh, to presidents and ministers and that sort of thing who, who are having bids on public works that our people will keep you out of trouble. We have something called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and our people have to abide by a set of rules that uh, unfortunately other countries don't. But uh, th this, all, this all sounds great, okay? Uh, you've got a lot of the same, you know, a lot of the really good things in terms of uh, the uh, Bolsa Familia and the guaranteed income and the debit card that Tom was talking about and that sort of thing. But then what happens is Bolsonaro is elected. Why, though? That's what I'm still not understanding. Let's talk about why is, is Jair... Bolsonaro elected. What, what are the conditions? Jair. 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 And so I what does Jose, why Jose, does, what does Jair Jose Jair like about Jair? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so Jose, I'm Jose, I'm voting for Jair, why? Did, did, by the way, did you, I never ran into Bolsonaro or any of the family, did you when you were ambassador there? Was, he's pro, was he prominent? Uh, he was not prominent. I mean, I did run into him, but although he'd spent uh, 27 years uh, in the Brazilian legislature, uh, uh, and was considered a character of sorts. Um, uh, he was not a, um, a political figure of, 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 of great import, um, which is why he's done so well. Uh, because in the aftermath of the corruption scandals uh, and in the, the, the middle class rage over uh, corruption and what else had been happening in, in Brazil, uh, the linkage between Brazil's political class and the Brazilian people broke. The lack of trust and confidence was dramatic, and in some ways, um, it was a political Jonestown for Brazil. Uh, it was almost a collective suicide by Brazil's political leadership. The and whole scandal, the Odebrecht scandals and the other scandals. Yes, that, and, okay. and this, opens a, and this yeah. opens a space for non-traditional politicians, especially someone like Jair Bolsonaro, who has been talking about law and order, about fighting corruption, uh, and about um, uh, taking away the idea, the, the, what he considered to be the, the ideological basis of, for Brazilian politics, the leftist uh, t tendencies in, in Brazilian politics. And, and he was able to emerge as, as, a, as a clear alternative to traditional political leadership. And it's what allowed him to win the election. So basically what you're saying is, it wasn't so much economic as, a, as it was political, and that was, mm. let's just wipe the slate clean. Drain the Get, swamp? Yeah, drain the swamp, so to speak. Mel, are you, are you, you agree? Well, Neil, I think, no, I think that's absolutely right. But I don't think you think there was analysis. a social and a cultural part of this, too, or no? That's what I'd like to understand better. I think, frankly, uh, again, I haven't been there for a while. I did take, by the way, a group of students to Brazil for, uh, for about 10 days. Uh, that we're in one of our programs here, and we went up and we tried to talk with regular Brazilians and some of the NGOs, et cetera. I think the Brazilian, I, I agree with Tom, the um, Brazilian people are just fed up with the system. At some point when this gets exposed, you know, everybody th thought about it. You know, they used to say about this uh, mayor of Sao Paulo, Malufi was his name. Mm -hmm. They'd said, um, they say, Jacoba mas faz. That is, he robs, but he, make, he gets things going. Yeah. Everybody uh -huh. knew it. As it turned out, by the way, he had, they found out that all the, he's got all his money, he had all his money stashed in Swiss banks and- Was he and part of the Panama Papers? Uh, I don't know whether he was part of the Panama Papers uh, uh, situation, but, uh, but in fact, he, um, it, it became clear, it became mm. public that he had been stealing this money. He was, a, he was a kind of a very charming rascal. I met with him. Uh, many times, and he ran Sao Paulo. You know, it was sort of a Mayor Daly of Sao Paulo. Mayor Daly plus much more corrupt than even Mayor Daly, I think, at that point. So I think, the, I think, um, you know, I think Tom and I both agree that 
the Brazilian people just because this stuff was exposed and was public, I think they're just fed up with the class and so they pick someone that we would say, how can they pick a guy like that? Well, they might be saying similar things about us, I guess. You know, but the, but, th the thing uh, is, uh, it, Social scientists have for a long, long time tried to figure out what gives rise in an electorate to strong men, taking advantage mm -hmm. of the democratic process to get elected and then trying what, what they can do to eviscerate that same process that got them elected. Whether you're talking about er Erdogan in Turkey or whether you're talking about Putin, uh, Hungary with um, Erdogan, uh, Poland now, unfortunately, Maduro, Chavez. It, it, it just seems like the economic explanation of people being left behind economically is completely insufficient to really describe the phenomena. It looks mm -hmm. like it is way more social, mm -hmm. way more political, way more value-laden than it, mm -hmm. it gives rise to a simple, you're marginalized economically, so now you're, you're desperate and you're gonna go with whomever. Was that happening in, uh, I mean, besides the corruption thing, um, the, you, you've got a Bolsonaro now who uh, is promoting gun rights in a country that really doesn't have a gun culture. Uh, he's, he's said horrible things about the indigenous as parasites. I, uh, about uh, homosexuals, he said that I'd rather have my son die in an automobile right. accident. I mean, he just way goes, go, goes over the top and he still has a pretty good approval rating. Yeah. may it's sound familiar to some of us yeah. here. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> No, but, but listen. <laughs> what is that all about, Tom? It's the same in Brazil as it is here. Voters are discerning. Voters are smart. Voters know what they want, and they know how to filter out stuff that they don't consider to be important. And for Brazilian voters, what was important was getting the economy back on track, fighting crime, fighting corruption, and to a certain extent, reorienting the country internationally and trying to build a better relationship with the United States. And sure, Bolsonaro had all kinds of other stuff that was going on around him, uh, in uh -huh. the same way that our president has all kinds of other stuff going on around him. But for voters who wanted a clear pathway forward, he offered it. And he offered something that was distinctly different from what his, uh -huh. uh, the, the, the opposing candidate, uh, Fernando Adagi, was, was offering at the time, a, a candidate of uh, President Lula's party. Uh, and in this regard, the, the, the Brazilians showed clearly that they were prepared to put up with the other rhetoric. Mm -hmm. If President Bolsonaro was prepared to focus on the primary purpose of, of his campaign, and I think what you're going to find, first of all, it's not at all clear that he's going to be a strong man. The mm -hmm. thing about Brazil is that mm -hmm. it's the big blob. It just takes you in and covers you uh, because it's such a large country, it's so diverse, it's so dynamic and it's a federal state and the states are important, the governors are important, the mayors are important. Uh, and he still has a, a party which, while it has leverage in, in the legislature and he still has popularity, the biggest uh, legislative challenge he's facing right now, which is pension reform, he is slow in pushing through uh, the assembly and it's being done in a way that while he's gonna get some of what he wants, he's not gonna get all of what he wants. But I think what we're going to see as he gets deeper into his presidency is that the Brazilians want him to focus on the three or four core interests that matter to them. And the extent to which he begins focusing elsewhere on some of his social rhetoric or environmental rhetoric, it is going to lead to greater um, tension within his government. It's going to lead to greater concerns among Brazilians, and it's going to dissipate his energy. Mm. So my hope is that he can, he can be disciplined and focused because Brazil doesn't have any options right now. And from the point of view of the United States, this guy has to be successful. Because if this guy is not successful, then we're going to have a Brazil which is going to be in a tougher place uh, over the next bunch of years and will not be as helpful to us as, as we try to build a new relationship with it. Well, to cap off this conversation, let's turn, uh, uh, I guess, a little late, but nonetheless, to the, uh, to the title. And that is U.S.-Brazil Bromance, hmm. What's in Store for Us? I, yeah. I don't know if any of you caught uh, the uh, meeting uh, between President Trump and uh, President Bolsonaro. They uh, seem to be kindred spirits in many, many ways. Uh, they exchanged, uh, I guess, the smiles, jerseys. Their smiles, are different. They're, they're not, they don't smile in the same way. They, they have... Diabolical, is that what you're trying well, to say? they're diabolical, perhaps, if so, but differently. They, as a side note. As a side note, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, a great meeting. 
And, and the three of us ex-diplomats here will all tell you that working with the Brazilian Foreign Ministry at the Marici was never easy, was never a picnic. Uh, uh, in too many cases, I found, and I'd like to hear what you guys have to say, uh, that uh, uh, Brazilian diplomats viewed any gains of the United States in the region as a as a net loss for them, you know, the zero-sum game. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. It's just their attitude about the United States. Yeah, you know, yeah. This, but, this uh, but, but now, change. Bolsonaro's changing that. Yeah. So, is that, a, is that, you know, and wants to cooperate on Venezuela, at the UN, on strategic things, common problems, trade, et cetera. I think he's opening up uh, the Brazilian uh, Space Center for uh, U.S. Uh, commercial uh, um, launches yeah. after, you know, at it. I mean, th what? the ground seems to be open for a lot more cooperation, and you don't see the anti U.S., mm -hmm. at least in its ascendancy, uh, that you used to see in the Brazilian foreign ministry all the time. So, do we say that's enough? That's good for us? You know, the, Brazil the Br Brazilian diplomats are about as well trained as any diplomatic yeah. corps that I've ever dealt with in my career. When I was and and I think the most highly paid, by the way, quite well, quite well paid. Yeah, mm -hmm. and also, uh, for example, in the 25 years between the time when I was first in Brasilia, and uh, when I was ambassador to Brazil, some of the names were the same because the sons mm -hmm. of the yeah. original foreign service officers were then in coming in. Is it like an English title? It gets but like but. When Cardoza, this a lot of it, you know, Russians have a nice expression that says a, a fish rots from its head. So when, in fact, Cardozo came in, he, he appointed uh, Foreign Minister Lamprea, who was not one of the, they used to, they called them Barbudos, the bearded ones, you know, the, the leftists and the yeah. nationalists in the Foreign Ministry. And it changed considerably. Our ability to um, uh, talk with them in a, in a reasonable way to try to get some cooperation with the Brazilians at the UN, for example, or at the, the WTO, we always had some problems. But... Uh, it changed considerably, so it depends on, you know, the, uh, on how the foreign ministry is structured now, and how he and his foreign minister uh, want the foreign ministry to operate. Uh, they can't operate, you know, on their own in in a sort of um, nationalistic or uh, anti-American way. It has to come from the uh, the the uh, the way they operate has to come from the president and from the foreign minister. So I think. Probably we'll have lots of opportunity, but you know I've talked to some Brazilian journalists lately, and I've said, you know, this Brazil is not a country that the American president wakes up and thinks about first thing in the morning, and unless there's a crisis in Brazil, it's not on the top of the priority list. So we'll see. I think the relationship certainly is going to is going to be better, but I'm not sure how far it will go or how important it will be in terms of world affairs. Well, this guy who's foreign minister, I don't know if you met him, uh, Ernesto uh, Araujo. Araujo, yeah. Uh, he, he, he was kind of plucked out of the mid ranks, from what I understand, and elevated to be the concierge, the, the, uh, the foreign minister. Um, is there, is he going to be able to lead an Itamarichi that's going to be able to get in line with Bolsonaro and to, to become much more proactive as it, and positive as it relates to the United States? Well, we're going to find out. Yeah. Um, I mean, er Ernesto was the deputy chief of mission, the number two uh, fellow at uh, Brazil's uh, embassy in Washington right. for quite some time. Right. That's, that's when I first met him. He's a good diplomat. He's a skilled diplomat. But as you said, he was head of North American affairs when he was uh, elevated to be the, mm -hmm. the foreign minister. And that's unusual in uh, Brazil's foreign policy structure. Um, but he can take credit for a very successful visit by President Bolsonaro to Washington. Right. And the fact of the matter is, it was, it was a successful visit for both sides. And Brazil got a fair bit out of it, some of it um, important symbolically, uh, such as support for Brazil's admission to the OECD, uh, the, um, and, which is an economic cooperation and development agency, uh, typically of developed countries. Um, and so to, to bring Brazil into that environment is, is almost as big as Brazil entering BRICS. Uh, also, um, because of its major non-NATO ally sta status, which gives, puts Brazil at the front of the line um, uh, with our NATO allies when it comes to purchasing uh, military equipment and certain kinds of cooperation and intelligence sharing. Um, 
and, 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 and maybe most importantly, the Technical Safeguards Agreement, uh, which is uh, done uh, by Brazil and the United States to allow for the sharing of certain kinds of sensitive technology and information related to space launch. Mm -hmm. and, and this is going to allow um, U.S. companies, among others, uh, to use uh, their Brazil space launch facility in Alcantara uh, to launch satellites. And this is uh, a big deal because it's an equatorial launch site. It's a much better launch site than okay. Cape Canaveral. Uh, it's going to be cheaper for American companies, but also it's going to open a space for the United States and Brazil to cooperate on space technologies, which are really intercontinental ballistic missile technologies. And this is something that our nuclear, our non-proliferation people, both nuclear non-proliferation and missile non-proliferation people, work jealously to guard. And the fact that this administration was able to open that door to the Brazilians was, was a, a pretty remarkable step. So I think in, in this moment, uh, we've had a very good start in terms of the personal relationships between the two presidents. I think that the visit itself accomplished uh, some important uh, first steps in building the relationship with a lot of potential. The trick now is to get our bureaucracies to work together on them. And that's where the challenge is going to be, because that's where you might end up encountering resistance. Uh, and, and that's where people like the foreign minister are going to play an important role. Yeah. You know, there was one maybe not very widely known thing that happened that I, that I thought was quite interesting. Um, Bolsonaro apparently is exploring the possibility of, you know, in Mercosur, they're basically a customs union. Uh, you're not supposed to do bilateral trade deals. He's trying to change I learned that, that the hard way with yeah, Chile, by yeah, the way. <laughs> yeah, I know. But he's trying to change that, yeah. and I presumably because he wants to do a deal with the United States. Hmm. Interesting. Presumably. Well, because but, Brazil, I think, you know, we had something called the Free Trade Area of the Americas, right. if you recall, which was a Clinton vision, U.S. vision of a free trade area throughout all of the Americas from Canada all the way to Chile. Now, we've done a lot of it bilaterally over the years, but back then it was supposed to be one big, huge trade zone, which would have been the biggest trade agreement in the world. Uh, and I have to tell you that Brazil did everything possible to stop it. Yeah, it was clear they didn't, they didn't want it to happen. They didn't want it to happen because, they again, the zero-sum game. In other words, if the United States is, is uh, leading this, we might have some interest in it, but their gain is our loss. It was just a reflexive kind of thing. They, they felt they'd be that the United States would dominate. Would dominate. If you look at the yeah. economic situation, you would think that as well, because our economy was, was so dominating, even for, for Brazil in terms of products. You know, when I was first in Brazil, it was coffee, coffee, coffee in, in the 60s. That's, that was the export. When I went back the second time, and I'm sure this is held on, rolled steel automobile parts, right? Uh, aircraft, as Tom, as Tom mentioned. We, you get on these short-range aircraft, chances are it might, be a, might have been built by Embraer. Yeah, sure. And so that took, a big, that took a big jump. And there's uh, soybeans, they're a bigger exporter than we are. Agro-business, big time. Yeah. So no, they, they, no question they've diversified. The they've economy. diversified and uh, we've had, this, we're competitors in a certain way, but also, as Tom said, we can be, you know, there are areas where we can, where we can cooperate in Brazil now with Bolsonaro. Maybe they'll open the door to that. So, Tom, you don't see uh, Bolsonaro threatening democratic institutions in, Bra in Brazil, or at least succeeding? I think Brazil's democratic institutions can take care of themselves. Hmm. Uh, and I think the Brazilian people are committed to those institutions, which doesn't mean that Bolsonaro might, na might not make headway in some areas that we find uncomfortable. And, and the point that I've made to Brazilians and others is that we've got a really strong kind of setup for the relationship. Um, and, and now we have to work on making that real. But in the process, the, what the president says is going to affect the tone of the relationship. Mm -hmm. In other words, if, if he continues um, uh, to, uh, to attack the LGBTQ population, if he continues to put in doubt the, the autonomy of indigenous peoples and the protection of indigenous peoples, if, if he um, threatens the well-being of the Amazon and biodiversity, this will generate a, a, a response here in the United States that's going to make the relationship harder uh, and, and that will not help him. Mm. And, and it will also, as I mentioned earlier, I think begin to, to challenge the support that some people are prepared to give him internally in Brazil. So mm. my hope is that, is that he can be disciplined. Um, but I'm, I'm quite confident uh, about Brazil's democratic institutions. Do you want to do questions? 
Um, any questions? Thanks. Uh, I'm John Torchari from the Ford School. I appreciate your, uh, your comments. And my question is about Brazil's foreign policy. We've touched on it a little bit in terms of its relationship with the United States. But of course, in this country, in the US, uh, Trump's brand of populist nationalism has a connection to a Jacksonian foreign policy that puts an emphasis on military power and a, and a, and a retreat from engagement with international institutions. Do you expect to see similar manifestations in Brazil's foreign policy with regard to its role in, in UN-linked bodies or, or even with the BRICS? I don't think, uh, well, you know, we have an example now. Uh, there have been, there's been talk about military intervention in Venezuela. Brazil would be a, a natural as a partner if that, if that happens. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's going to happen, and I think there will be um, pushback from the, from the military in getting involved in, uh, in that way. They've had their experience with things before that, that didn't work. Um, I think it, it's still too early to, to, to say what kind of foreign policy Bolsonaro is going to have. I think he will be um, very anxious to be a partner with the United States. I think he likes Trump, and he likes the fact that, that Trump is, um, is sort of pressing democracy to get more power as a number of, as we mentioned, a number of other democratically elected leaders around the world have, have been, become more autocratic, and I think that's sort of his natural tendency. But I think he's, I think, as Tom said, I think he's going to be stymied by the Brazilian system and the democracy and the press in Brazil as well. Press is, I wouldn't, I, press is free in Brazil, uh, I would say in many cases irresponsibly free. But, well, I mean, but, they, but they had, free. they found themselves kindred spirits during the White House meeting uh, because uh, Bolsonaro started out by talking about fake news in Brazil. So, I mean, that just rang uh, President Trump's chimes right away. Well, no two peas in a pod. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I wanted to say something. Um, let me begin by saying that I have a different relationship to Brazil than the ones that you have all expressed. Because Why I actually. You identify yourself so oh, yeah. I, I am a faculty member here at the University of Michigan, Sociology and American Studies, Sylvia Pedraza. And I do most of my research has to do with Cuba, Puerto Rico, Mexico, Venezuela. Uh, you know, so it's not Brazil, but I do have a relationship mm -hmm. uh, that has to do with Brazil. And that is that when I was in graduate school at the University of Chicago, we had a lot of Brazilians there at the time. And later on, my first job was in St. Louis, Washington University in St. Louis. And there also, there were a number of Brazilians on the faculty. Uh, in Chicago, it was mostly graduate schools. And, and these folks were the refugees and the exiles and the children of the people who had been exiled during the military junta, okay? Uh, so it doesn't surprise me one bit when you say that Brazilians are very committed to democracy because all the people that I knew became so because they had lived through the hardships of the years of the dictatorship and they would not want any kind of return to that. You know? So they're going to preserve democracy in Brazil whether it's of the right or of the left. And they picked up a lot of values being in Europe at the time you know, with respect to democratic socialism and so on. People who had been part of the guerrillas, you know, espousing um, armed conflict and being pro Che Guevara and so on in, during the years of the military, uh, then went to, for example, Poland, one of my good friends, went to Poland thinking that he would become a communist and go back to Brazil, becoming a real communist. And he said he started having nightmares every, every night when he lived in the real communist society. And then little by little, he became a democratic socialist. You know? So I think Brazil is a, is a place where there are a lot of people. One of those people was, in fact, also uh, Cardoso, is also mm -hmm. an exile of, of those years. Uh, so there, I think that the political spectrum in, in Brazil, and in, in that vast middle class that you're talking about, because people did return after Apertura, yeah, they did go back and they did establish themselves there. Um, I think it's a very rich political spectrum, and I, I actually have more confidence in them politically than I have in Americans that have not lived uh, very extreme situations. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I think it's interesting that um, just before I came here, I read that uh, Bolsonaro had uh, uh, fired his Minister of Education because the Minister of Education had uh, dictated 
that they would remove the negative references of the 20-year military dictatorship. Uh, uh, apparently, all the school children uh, in in uh, in Brazil would read, you know, kind of the negative parts of of a military dictatorship, which is obvious. Uh, but he demanded that all of that be removed. There was so much pushback. And this goes back to Tom and, and what Tom and Mel were saying, and that is that they firmly believe that Brazil democracy will survive this. There was so much pushback by teachers and parents that this was being overlooked or, 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 or in, in some way having a shiny gloss put on it when it wasn't, uh, that uh, he was forced to resign. Hmm. So at the end of the day, you may be right. Hmm. You know, the education system, for example, now, I'm, I'm, Tom, you can tell me if this has changed much in that period of time. We had, when President Clinton came, we had a country-to-country uh, uh, -country education agreement. One of the things that um, our people found out was a very strange part of their system. If you were, if you were a rich person, uh, you would send your kids to a private school and Inevitably, they'd be elected to a free public university, which are the best ones in Brazil, like Sao pa University of Sao Paulo, which be. In They're free. Place. There's no to it. No, no tuition. Wow. There are some, you know, like uh, the Catholic University, which is a good university, has tuition. If you were poor, right, you sent your kid to a what, not very good public school, and you couldn't get into a free public university, unless and unless you sacrificed and were able to scrounge up the money to be able to send them to a, a regular a university where you pay tuition. Mm -hmm. Now, and the, the, I remember the education minister at the time was very intent on trying to change that system because it perpetuated yeah. the rich elite and didn't allow for much movement upwards. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know whether that has changed very much. I haven't seen mm -hmm. you know, news that that, 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 that the whole system has changed. But that's an important part also of you know, sort of this rising middle class. You mm -hmm. need education to be able to break out of just, you know, the the um, the class that, for example, the PT ap uh, 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 appeal to. Um, Tom, do you think history will be kind to Lula? Mm -hmm. I do. Um, I think it'll be kinder to Fernando Enrique Cardozo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because of what Cardozo did. But I believe in some ways uh, Lula's accomplishments will be seen as um, expanding the, um, the number of people who benefit from the Brazilian economy, addressing uh, the issue of uh, extreme poverty uh, in Brazil, especially in the northeastern part of Brazil. But I also think to a certain extent he inoculated Brazil against the kind of populism that we were seeing in Venezuela, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, mm -hmm. and in Argentina, uh, and uh, clung to the, the economic policy and approaches that Fernando Enrique Cardozo had put in place and created enough continuity of, of policy and stability in policy to allow the, the Brazilian economy to continue to grow. Now, there'll be any number of... Um, of, of criticisms, criticisms of him as they are, as, as, as any president has to endure. Uh, but I, I think he will be, be seen as, as someone who was able to, to ensure that, that Brazil didn't fall under the influence of the kind of populism that we saw elsewhere in South America. You know, it's, uh, so I, when I got to Brazil, it was in the middle of the election campaign, and I said to one of the staff in the political section, why don't we see if I can uh, just meet with some of with some of the candidates? Just not you know not to say anything political, but just to get to know them and hear what they have to say, et cetera. So I met with almost every one of the candidates, and there were a number of them at the time, except for Lula. They, he wouldn't meet. So after he was defeated, I said, "See if Lula will come over to the ref, uh, over to the residence for lunch sometime." And he did, and he brought Mercadente, he brought some of his people with him. You know, and I was, um, here, here's this very kind of rough and tumble guy, he's got a few fingers missing from having worked in the factory. Yeah, he was a machine He was machine a machine operator. Machine operator. Yeah. But, um, you know, he was a good listener. Mm. Uh, he, he didn't say too much, but, you know, he had sort of, sh he didn't have to be ideological at the time. 
And so when I reported back, you know, its government was interested in it, he's still a leader in Brazilian society, I said, my, po my impression of Lula was quite positive. It, the, the impression of him before, at least in sort of the American government's eyes, was, you know, he was going to re, uh, renounce the debt, he was going to do, he was going to be anti-American, he was going to do all these bad things, and so there was some fear. Tom is absolutely right. He was smart enough to figure out that he needed to take what was good and what was left to him and preserve it and then add on to it, which he did in the, basically in the social side. Remember, one of the first things he did is hire a finance minister who was the um, president of the Bank of Boston in Brazil, right. Mireles. And so they kept, you know, they, was, they were able to keep inflation down. They didn't overspend. He was um, a diamond in the rough, really, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah, but you know, at the end of the day, they get him on kind of yeah. butkus charges. I mean, you know, really, when you think about the scope and the, and, and the, and the amount of money that was involved with uh, the, the, uh, the car wash scandal and Petrobras and, and uh, Odebrecht and uh, all of that, they got him on taking a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of, uh, of services and, and uh, construction uh, money in refurbishing a condo on the beach. President Clinton was impeached by the Congress because he had an affair with a young person. I mean, that was not a, that was not a, a huge yeah. theft of yeah. government. Yeah, right. No. If, if leaders don't think to themselves, what's my legacy going to be, you know, they, this, this happens. It so happens. Some, you don't, you, you'd say, well, it's a small thing, but you don't expect that of a president of the country. Right. You know, and that's, mm -hmm. that's what happened to Lula, I think. And he was being made... He was being made an example of because they were in the mood to the, the prosecutors and the judges that were doing yeah. this were in the mood to try to bring this to public attention, actually convict people, put them in jail for whatever crimes they committed. And so that's what happened with Lula, along with some who had taken millions and millions of dollars. I, I think we have a couple of questions. Um, hi, my name is Christian. I'm a graduate student at Health Informatics at School of Information, and I'm an incoming public policy student next year. Um, so and, uh, my question is more related to um, talking about the Odebrecht scandal. And my mom's Peruvian. I'm from Argentina, so that was a big deal uh, when that all happened, and that was linked to Peru's instit political institution. and. Uh, several presidents were involved in it, and there was a, a whole money trail involved in that. Um, given the situation that has happened out of that, and a lot of people are very frustrated with the political institutions of several different South American countries, such as Peru, uh, some places uh, in Argentina, and some uh, as well as the Paraguay, and some all the all the players involved in that scandal. Uh, do you think that his election? could cause a ripple effect um, in terms of other, uh, of the rising populism, uh, uh, that people feel like they wanna like, uh, want to make sure that their uh, corruption is tackled for f first and foremost. Um, and would that depend, uh, how, how would that be, because you, you always mention, you mentioned that it depends on how the institution strong, the democratic institution is strong enough. Mm -hmm. Are other countries, strong enough to withstand something like this as well? Well, Guatemala did. Guatemala can do it. Peru can do it. Argentina can do it. Chile can do it. Um, so, I mean, corruption will be a big deal um, uh, across many uh, elections. But, but to a certain extent, there already is a reorientation of sorts politically in South America. and. Bolsonaro's election is not the first part of that. Um, South America, which at one point uh, was colored pink because of left of center or progressive governments, is not pink anymore. Um, I mean, if you look at Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Peru, Colombia, the major, and, and you could almost put Ecuador in that, in that plot. That would, that um, uh, you have a if not center-right governments, at least governments that have moved away from um, uh, previous progressive ideologies and approaches. And as they've done so, they've actually created a, a I think, a possibility uh, for South American politics to move beyond ideological claims for votes. Uh, and increasingly, voters are going to look not to ideologies but accomplishment. And the, to the extent that political leaders and political parties show that they can get things done, 
they'll be reelected uh, and elected. Uh, and, and it's no longer a case of, of presenting yourself either as the leftist candidate or the rightist candidate, because I think ideologies have corroded and people have lost trust in them, and they really want leadership that uh, can, can deliver the goods. Does it ring a bell at home here? <laughs> um, hi, I'm a master's student here at the Ford School. Actually, I'm the only Brazilian who stands here. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having this event. I'm really happy that it happened. Um, I wanted to play a little bit of the, ad the devil's advocate and ask you for um, your opinion on the Judge Moro and the Lava Jato car wash. Like I know I was in the mm -hmm. class and the lecture that mm -hmm. we just um, had this afternoon and you spoke a little bit like you complimented uh, the, Lava, the car wash operation, mm -hmm. which I also think it's a very good thing that came out yeah. of Brazil, but I'm very skeptical with its political intentions, especially recently. It's um, for those who, doesn't know, who don't know, the, the main judge that was the architect behind this operation is now the Minister of Justice which I think at least it put his reputation mm -hmm. at risk. So I kind of I wanted to hear a little bit of your views on it. Thank you. Would you like us to talk about Sergio Morro in particular or? or OK. Well, Who first of all, that? Sergio Morro was a, 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 a judge in uh, Curitiba, if I remember properly. Uh, who began, became the focal point for the, the car wash investigation. And he was the one who drove the investigations uh, and ultimately ordered the arrests. Uh, of all the many people who got caught up in this. Uh, and working with the federal police um, developed uh, all of the, the cases uh, in, in, the er, in the early going. And he has been named the Minister of Justice uh, by uh, President Bolsonaro. Uh, and obviously there are some who were, who were very concerned uh, that uh, Judge Moho, who had established himself as this beacon of um, of positive action uh, against corruption was suddenly going to put himself into the soup with all of the corrupt powers that be uh, and that this ultimately would taint him in some fashion. And there were also concerns that President Bolsonaro was going to use him against his political enemies and to kind of redirect um, uh, corruption investigations. But uh, Moho is very respected here in the United States um, and has engaged with uh, U.S counterparts in, in a really intelligent way. And I think in, in some ways, um, he is one of the few members of Bolsonaro's cabinet who cannot be fired. Uh, and that's a powerful uh, place to be, I think. And it's I, called I, the Supreme Court of the United States of America. <laughs> pretty much. And, 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 and I think what this means is, is I mean, Mojo's biggest challenge is Moving from a judgeship to a, a cabinet ministry is a big deal. Um, and it, it requires a lot of help. Uh, but if he has the right kind of help around him, I think he has the potential of being a hugely important justice minister and somebody who can begin to institutionalize anti-corruption efforts in ways that could be very positive uh, for Brazil going forward. You know, we've had uh, traditionally here a number of Brazilian lawyers who have come to our law school and done I know several of them have done research. I've had some contacts with them as well, and they have a very high opinion of, of Morho. Of course, they all, remember, young prosecutors and young lawyers have the bit in their, in, their, in, their, in their teeth right now. They're the ones who have driven all this. And, you know, when you get momentum in, in an area like that where corruption is being found out, um, things should change should change. So having Moro there with his reputation, I would think, would be a warning to those yeah. in the system that ha would have a tendency to corrupt or skim or whatever it is, make deals, um, put them on warning that, um, you know, the, the game has changed. By the way, if you, if you think that our government has changed with uh, a lot uh, in terms of the cabinet, people leaving, people coming, look at Brazil. I mean, they seem to have a... a I'm not talking about, we'll see with Bolsonaro, but before ministers leave, ministers come and go, you, it's like a merry-go-round. You can't tell who's going to be there next time. So if there's some continuity, and particularly if Moro stays, I think there can, I, I agree with you, I think there can be significant change in, in the Brazilian uh, system of justice and in, uh, in the way the society looks at the government. I just got one last question, uh, and that is, um, 
Are both of you saying that, that um, what we say, what many people say in the United States who support President Trump um, basically say, don't really look at the divisiveness and the rhetoric and that sort of thing, look at, look at what he does and what he stands for, okay? In Brazil, taking that whole thought to, to, to Brazil, do you think that, that, that uh, the electorate in Brazil will, will pretty much, if they haven't already concluded the same thing, and that is that Bolsonaro stands for an abrupt change from the old order, from, a, from a corruption that was endemic, et cetera, et cetera. Let's not worry about comments that he makes about the LGBTQ community or indigenous people or whatever it might be. Let's just go with the fact that he's, a, he's, he's, he's part of a change and we're gonna, we're, you know, we're gonna continue with him as our president because of, uh, of the fact that he recognizes the place in history that he is right now with Brazil. I think that was the vote. That was how people thought as they walked into the, the polling places and mm -hmm. cast their, their ballots. Um, now that President Bolsonaro is president, I think that's going to evolve. Um, you know, Brazil is a, a big, diverse society, uh, but it's still fairly conservative. It's still fairly traditional. Um, but even with that conservatism and that traditionalism, um, it is a live and let live country. Uh, yeah. And I, I just don't see Brazil buying into the, the, the social rhetoric of the president. And that's why I said earlier that, for, that if he wants to be successful, he has to be disciplined and he has to be focused on, on achieving um, the, the core issues or, or areas of concern that, that, that got him elected and taking advantage of this particular moment in time. Uh, other, otherwise, he's gonna find himself trying to ideologize uh, Brazil in a, in a different way that, that I, I don't think is going to be um, under, work. understood or worked. Mm -hmm. But um, let, let me just close by, by saying, before I turn it over to, to Mel, um, let me just close by saying Tom Jobim, who was a, 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 an incredible Brazilian artist and composer. Uh, if you've listened to the, the Girl from Ipanema or any of these, uh, his Bolsa Nova songs, you would know him. Uh, he once famously said that um, uh, Brazil is not for beginners. Uh, and what he meant by that is Brazil's a complicated place. I mean, it kind of appears kind of light and airy and fun from football to carnival to music, but it, it has a deep history to it. Um, and, and that needs to under, uh, be understood. But while Jobim was right, I, I added an axiom. I added something else, which is Brazil is not for short timers. Uh, and it's not for hot money. It's not for people who want immediate political advantage. It's, Brazil is about relationships, and it's about relationships that endure across a lifetime, both of individuals and countries. Uh, and uh, I think we're gonna find as, as we get deeper into this, this period of time that the Brazilians will see, especially in their relationship with the United States, uh, an, an important point of stability uh, and an important way to drive their, their own economy and their own society forward. And so I, I think we're in a very good place. Well, that's, that's good to hear. Uh, positive news from somewhere. Uh, Mel, last words? Yeah, Brazil sort of gets under your skin, I think. You know, in my day, back in the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, there were a bunch of Brazilianists. Many of them had, been, uh, had served in the Soviet Union, another big country. And I was aspiring to serve in the Soviet Union as well because the, the, the country's big, it's vigorous. Um, you you got to love the Brazilians. Uh, they're, and, they're, and they vary from north to south. Yeah. When I served in the north, it was a kind of, you know, which is not the most developed area in Brazil, it was a kind of genteel society. People were nice, people were kind, people went out of your way to do things for you, even in very difficult circumstances. As I say, it gets, it gets under your skin. So I always try to be optimistic and it makes, you know, it kind of gets under my skin when I see the corruption coming because I don't th you know, that's not gonna help Brazil become a great country at all. In fact, it's diminished it somewhat in the eyes of the world. But Brazil's active, it has a role to play, it has a role to play in the region, it has a role to play internationally. Remember one thing, Brazilians have been very active in UN affairs. They've, they've been very active in the international civil service. Many of them have served as uh, representatives of the, of the Secretary General. And lost their lives. Uh, lost their in lives, Iraq. exactly, in Iraq. We had an example of, of that kind. So it's a big active country and um, I think, I think it's very special. I hope things work well. 
I don't think, I hope that Bolsonaro casts aside these things that he said during the campaign and tries to accomplish something and get things done because I think there's a lot of both human capital and a lot of natural resources in Brazil that will allow it to be even, uh, even a, a more outstanding country and a, and a leader in international affairs. Okay, compañera, where are we? Um, from music, we have the girl wait from- Wait a minute, wait a minute, we what? need to outro. We oh, by the way, out. Tom Jobim, when, the first trip that President Cardozo made to the United States after he was elected, mm. Tom Jobim had died in the United States the night before oh, wow. of a, uh, I think, a failure in the hospital of, of his liver or, or, uh, and a um, national icon. Yeah. I mean, people were all over Brazil. It's, and the same thing happened with some of their race car drivers. You know, they have these huge demonstrations, and a couple of, them, a couple of the famous ones were killed in crashes. I mean, they're really attached to these, uh, to these icons, especially Tom Jobim. Well, President Trump mentioned Pele and other, uh, and other uh, very famous football stars. But, you know, the, the thing that, uh, that I'm struck with is that a lot of our diplomats who serve in Brazil keep coming back. Yeah. There's something sure. there that keeps, uh, keeps attracting them back to, uh, to, to our service uh, uh, in, uh, in Brazil. The other part of it, too, is that um, I think, I'm hoping that through this podcast that we're doing, American Diplomat, not only do we get a better appreciation for what it is our diplomats do and say and that sort of thing overseas, but that also in these kinds of uh, fora, in these kinds of episodes, that we're able to really look at what other countries go through and borrow the best of what works, as opposed to thinking that somehow we've got all the answers. No, we don't have all the answers. And there are things that have been tried and failed, and there's things that have been tried and work, like the Bolsa Familia and other things, uh, that maybe are the answer to a lot of the kind of debates that we have in the United States that never seem to get beyond the capitalism versus socialism, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of closing the, uh, uh, the wage gap in the United States that uh, s seems to be growing uh, on an hourly, if not minute basis. So anyway, look, let's take a look at uh, Brazil. Uh, I think it was an, an, an interesting episode for all of us. And uh, Laura, what do we have for music? Jobim, Girl from Ipanema. Enjoy. We can all sing it. Oh, will you? I'll sing it with you. All right. How's uh, no, it no, start? No. Without music? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll do a duet. A uh, duet? Yeah, we'll do wait. you know it in Portuguese? N no, teach me. Oh, okay. Do it. Okay. Uh. <laughs> How's it start? All right, okay. All right. All right, well, that's why we have Jovi. Olha que coisa mais linda, mais cheia de graça, ela menina que vem que passa, coisa mais linda que já vi passar. And I don't sing the rest. Oh, hey, that's so beautiful. <laughs> this is a first. This is a podcast episode that yeah. has Mel Levitsky singing <laughs> among his other talents. Thank you so much, Mel. Yes, thank you. Is there anything you wanted to sing uh, before? before? <laughs> Mel has said it all. Yeah. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you all.